uh, that covers uh, part of our constituency, and um, we're very happy to uh, to have you here. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, uh, briefly um, some of the um, some of the major uh, um, issues that you see that are defining this race right now, uh, and uh, the last 35 days. Well, obviously we have an open seat. Doesn't happen very often. Um, I think the primary was more of a referendum on John Tierney. Um, so, you know, and rightly so, people decided that they needed a new uh, congressman. And I think people are looking at both candidates, what we, what we both, both bring to the table. Um, in my case, I think I can make a pretty good case that I, I'll be a great change agent in Washington. You know, for me, the, you know, I watched the primary pretty closely, and Seth Moulton's rationale for running was to keep the seat blue and to, you know, that he would be a reliable Democratic vote. And I think that people are looking for something beyond that right now. They want to elect people to go to Washington who are actually willing to work together, cross party lines, and change the direction of the country. And I also think that, um, you know, I have the experience having served in the state legislature. I understand how um, bills become law, how you have to work with people who don't, you know, you don't necessarily agree with um, on most issues. Um, and that as a member of the majority party, I think I can do a lot for the state, uh, the district, the state, and here in the region. You know, right now in Washington, when issues come up um, at a table like this, there's nobody from Massachusetts sitting there saying, here are the special needs and concerns of our region of the country. And to be a member of the majority party, I'm certainly not going to agree, you know, and there are a lot of disagreements, obviously, that I have with the national party. But I do think having somebody there who can advocate um, and be a strong advocate is really important. So, you know, those are the things I'm talking to people about. I'm getting a great response as I go around. Um, I've been pretty give, much... Give us, give us one or two examples where your voice as a Republican working with the, the Democrat dominant uh, congressional delegation might be really beneficial. Uh, well, I think, first of all, Obamacare is probably the best example. You know, we had a very particular situation in our state that we had really done our job. Ninety-eight percent of the people in Massachusetts were insured. We had a health care plan that was working. And when the federal one-size-fits-all program overlapped um, here in Massachusetts, it set us backwards rather than forward. And I think that there are things that could have been done, um, at least for our state, to be able to say, hey, look, you know, here's what's going on in Massachusetts. We shouldn't be treated unfairly. I think there were 1,200 waivers given out um, when Obamacare first went into effect. If you live in Nancy Pelosi's district, you know, they gave out waivers for bars and nightclubs in our district. But here we are in a state with 6 million people, and we couldn't get a break, you know, um, and even though we had done our job. So I think um, on health care issues, um, having been in the legislature and supported our state law, that I could have been a good voice to help move things forward. I would say fishing aid um, was a big mm -hmm. issue. You know, um, when the, uh, the, legis the Congress did end up appropriating $150 million, uh, $75 million, but the way the process worked is the House did not appropriate one cent. The Senate appropriated 150 I sell houses all the time and negotiate, and when you have one side who comes in with zero and the other side that comes in with 150 million, you usually split it, you split it the difference, and that's what ended up happening. We ended up with 75 million dollars, and of that, you know, it's going to filter down um, uh, to the fact, you know, that um, you know, at the bottom, at the end of the day, the fishermen aren't getting as much in aid as they could have. Even if they could have put 50 million dollars uh, in the house side, you know, you'd be you know, we would have ended up with a better result. So I think that that's another good example. Um, and I think that there are a lot of issues that are very pertinent to our state and region. You know, we have the winter coming up right now. Fuel assistance program is always a big issue. Um, uh, you know, 37 percent increase in electric rates um, about to hit people this winter. Um, the fuel assistance program, having somebody from the Northeast that can go to the leadership and say, hey, you know, this is do or die for people in my region of the country. A lot of the, you know, the Republicans come from the South and other regions of the country. Um, I think, you know, having somebody who can just be in their face and say, hey, this is really important, um, you might end up getting a better result. You know, and I'm not saying I can go to Washington and change the world. But I do think that a lot of the issues that are important to people here end up getting put on the back burner 
because we have all our eggs in one basket down there right now. So, and and so, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Right. I was going to say, and you know, nobody doubts that the result of this election is going to be that the Republicans continue to hold the House, both this cycle and probably into the future, and not to have anybody um, in the state and the delegation who can go and say, hey, you know, um, our state's important too, and you know, and get our issues on the agenda. I think hurts us, and it's and it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. And this is a state that you know Tip O'Neill came from, Kennedy came from, Moakley. We're used to having an outsized um, amount of influence in Washington right now, and we don't have really any. It's embarrassing, I think, that the state is hiring lobbyists <laughs> to go down, to, you know, lobby Congress for Hanscom Air Force Base and defense issues. Um, because there's nobody in the majority who can actually do the lobbying uh, uh, for the state. Uh, we shouldn't have to hire somebody to do that. And I'm not putting down anybody in the delegation at all. It's just, you know, the fact of life, the way things are down there right now. So I think I could make a, a pretty positive difference as far as being part of the delegation and part of the team uh, for Massachusetts. You know, you mentioned being a change agent. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase you used, right? Um, your opponent has basically said the same thing. He has said that um, Congress is broken, so why send the same piece back? Mm -hmm. it essentially saying, you know, I'm, a, I'm new blood and I can, I can maybe change it. So um, aren't you more like him in, in well, first of all, yourself a change agent? So is he. So first of all, I've never, I've never served a day in Congress. Um, but I would say that, yeah, I am a change agent because the difference between us is that he's, you know, he calls himself a no-excuse progressive and supports a lot of the policies that President Obama has been pushing, um, both you know taxes, regulations, bad laws being passed, um, that have really sent the country in the wrong direction. Um, I don't think people want somebody to go down there and be a reliable Democratic vote. I think that they want people who will put the country first. And I think when it comes to that, I have anybody can say they're going to be a change agent or that they're going to be independent-minded. But in my case, I have a history of doing it. I, mean, I served in the legislature. I had a very independent voting record. When Mitt Romney was governor, I voted with him 50% of the time. I voted against him 50% of the time. And I did that based on what I thought was best for the people in my district and the state. And the, you know, the only promise I'll make during the entire campaign is that I'll take that same type of independent-mindedness down to Washington and, um, and vote for what's best for the country. You just mentioned the bad laws bad laws being passed. Can you name, can you cite a couple of these so-called bad laws? Well, Don't use Obamacare. No, I won't use Obamacare, but I'll use pieces of Obamacare. No, um, let's, let's say everyone uses Obamacare. No, 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 no. What's a bad law that's been well, passed? A bad, law is cha bad law is changing the 40-hour work week. A terrible law, part of Obamacare. What that ended up doing was that, you know, I met a woman who works in retail in Beverly. Uh, she worked there for tw at a company for 20 years. It closed down. She figured that with the experience that she had, she wouldn't have any trouble um, finding a new job. But if you're in retail and other sectors of the economy right now, companies do not want to hire people for more than 29 hours. Very hard to get full-time jobs. Just changing that one section of Obamacare, I think, would be really important um, because, um, again, um, you know, nobody nobody wants to have the full time equivalents. But can you can you speak in specifically in the, the medical device of medical other bad laws. medical device tax? Another bad law that's stifling job creation in this district. We have one of the highest concentrations of medical device companies uh, here in Massachusetts in this district. Um, and if you if and the tax is pretty bad, it's two point three percent on gross revenue, not net. So you could be a company small startup losing money and ha end up having to pay the tax on your gross income. That doesn't um, end up promoting innovation. A lot of companies that were planning to hire people have stopped, um, you know, uh, put the brakes on it. And that's another problem. Uh, another issue, I, I, I bumped into somebody, I'm not going to name the name of the company, but they've, it's a family company. They've been expanding every year, opening different outlets. Um, Again, in uh, Obamacare, there's a provision that says that once you hit 50 employees, you're subject to all the mandates of the law and the cost of the law. Um, he was at 40. I asked him, where are you expanding this year? And he said, oh, cancel plans because I'm at 47 employees. I don't want to hit 50. And once I hit 50, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm staying away from that. So those are all lost jobs. So I would say that 
Um, those are examples of bad laws that are being passed. I know they were part of a bigger um, law, but those are things that could be done. Forget the whole debate about Obamacare. Those are things that could be done immediately um, to help uh, the economy. I think Dodd-Frank has turned out to be a very difficult law. Yeah, in theory, it sounds great that you know you want to hold the big banks accountable, but that's not what the law did. The law is really impacting community banks right now and making it very difficult. You know, talk to any community banker, they'll tell you that they, they're spending more time on compliance than being creative and, and putting you know together loans for small but businesses. Banking still uh, is a very lucrative business. Um, I think if you look at what's going on with banking right now, uh, a lot of yeah. I guess if you're, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, one of the big banks on Wall Street, you're doing pretty well. But uh, most local banks, if you talk to local bankers, they'll tell you it's a really difficult environment. That's why you're seeing all these mergers take place. You know, every well, low. I mean, we did, we we hear from Enterprise Bank. They post, they post profits quarter after quarter. But, so I mean, how how really difficult is it? Well, banks. the difficulty is that every day you have 8,000 small businesses that are being, being denied financing. Um, and the reason why that's happening is because the banking regulations have become so stringent. Again, not for Goldman Sachs and, you know, and I can understand why the law, you know, that, that was obviously a problem. But when you're, when you're on the ground level and you're talking to um, people who are actually responsible for you know getting loans out into the community helping small businesses um, talk to them and they'll tell you that it's getting more and more difficult next year um, under um, under Dodd Frank there are going to be new lending regulations that uh, for consumers that are, are going to be coming out and at the end of the day what it's going to end up doing um, is hurting the middle class and lower middle class families because the lending requirements are going to be a lot tougher than they are uh, right now in order to qualify for a federally insured loan and you're going to end up with you know um, again if you're at the top of the income scale it's not going to really matter all that much but um, you know the, the first time home buyers if you're an independently uh, if you're if you're a, you know a, a small business owner who owns your own company it's going to be much more harder to meet the requirements uh, for those laws um, for, for, for the you know for those uh, new regulations, so I think there's a lot of things that are going on uh, through the economy right now, and I spend probably, you know, at least four or five uh, visits a week uh, to small, medium, large sized companies, asking them what's going on, um, and I'll tell you the main problem in this country right now is that we're not creating jobs anymore. Yeah, there are plenty of minimum wage jobs, plenty of part-time jobs, plenty of temporary jobs that are being created, but not the type of jobs that people need to live, work, and raise a family. And when you talk to small business owners, you know, what they all say, you know, is that, yeah, you know, I'd love to hire somebody again, but they're looking six months, eight months, a year down the line, and you don't want to be putting yourself out, overextending yourself, hiring somebody, and then having to end up backtracking later on. Would you support the calls to increase the minimum wage? Well, you know, I would say... I mean, based I, on what you're hearing from those... Well, I'll tell you what, in the, in the legislature, I always voted to increase the minimum wage. I was um, uh, a bit skeptical when it came up here in the state, but at this point, if you're a manufacturer in Lowell and you're making sprockets and um, you're paying $11 an hour for minimum wage, um, and your competitor is in Kansas City, and they're paying seven dollars and twenty-five dollars an hour to their employees, and you, you know, here you're going to have in electric in uh, increases of thirty-five percent. We have higher health care costs. You're not going to be competitive. So at this point, I would vote for increasing the federal minimum wage um, because I think that Massachusetts businesses are going to be at such a competitive disadvantage with businesses. Around the country, so uh, yeah, you know. So where does that stand? Obama wanted to increase it, right? But it's he wants to dollars. increase it, I think, to ten dollars an hour, ten ten. Um, but yeah, we're going to be. This has already increased. It, yeah, right. But we're going to be. At, we've already increased it here, it's and, 11, no? and we're going to be at eleven. So I mean, again, if you're a manufacturing company and Bill Ricca, how do you comp your competitor isn't necessarily in Tewksbury. They're all around the country, and if you're already saddled with higher, you know, um, energy costs which we, you know, traditionally has been the case here in New England, um, you're not on an even playing field. I mean, health insurance is higher, the cost of living is higher. 
So I, you know, I guess I selfishly for Massachusetts, <laughs> in order to keep us afloat, um, I, at this point I would vote for the I would vote for the um, the higher wage national. Can you talk just for a couple of minutes about um, you know the the, the the general election? It was widely s speculated that you really wanted to uh, for a rematch against Tierney. Um, your view. I'm not saying this was your view, but this was out there that you know he was wounded and that you almost took him out two years ago. Mm -hmm. and that's really who you wanted to get this November, but you know he was defeated, yeah. and you have this young kind of fiery upstart, and it's your worst nightmare heading into the November oh, election. You know so talk about that for a minute. I mean, no, how, you know what? I I can't let's hear that straight from the horse's mouth. Yeah, I can't control what happened on the Democratic that. side, and a lot of my supporters told me they were going and voting in the Democratic primary, um, and why they were there, they were going to vote against John Tierney. And like I said, the primary was a referendum on John Tierney. And I do think, you know, I'm not talking about anything differently after the primary that I'm ta I talked about before. You know, I, I mean, I decided to run for Congress two years ago and, and, and again this time because I really do think the country's heading in the wrong direction. And I think that um, when it comes to taxes, when it comes to, you know, spending, when it comes to reg over-regulation, the size and scope of government, we're headed in the wrong direction, and I think I bring a different perspective. You know, um, Seth Moulton has pretty much said he's going to vote exactly the same way as John Tierney. So where's the change? That's why I'm saying I think I can be a real change agent. And for those people who really and um, don't think that the Republican Party has done a very good job in the House as far as governing, um, I would just say that you know I'm somebody who, who has served in the legislature here. People know me. Um, you know, I've never voted to shut down the government. Would and you? I would never vote to shut down the government. Um, and I, I, you know, I saw the harm that that did in my own business. I mean, the minute you start talking about shutting down the government, nobody's calling to <laughs> inquire about buying houses. I mean, the, you know, the, I don't think people in Washington necessarily have a, um, an understanding of the actions and the, the you know, vitriol that takes place there, how it filters down uh, to the Main Street level. and. Um, but I do think that within the Republican Party, I can be a change agent, too. And, you know, I'm somebody who owns my own business, I'm somebody who served when I was the minority leader in the state house. I was always very respectful uh, to people who I disagreed with. Um, you and I could be in a fight one day about, uh, you know, a certain issue, but I was smart enough to know that the very next day, you and I might be allies on another issue. And just being able to work with people um, is something that uh, is a job skill that uh, I've learned at the State House. But my professional life, I deal with very emotional buyers, very emotional sellers, obstacles in the middle. My job is to remove obstacles and bring the parties together to consummate a sale. That's the type of job skill we need right now in Washington. You know, most of the people down there, they're in silos, both Republican and Democrats. They're both just as bad. You know, um, they love their party more often than they love their country. And I do think that I can go down to Washington as somebody, you know, who put the country first. I don't want to be down there for decades. You know, I want to go down. I feel like I already had my legislative career. I've had a good business career. I want to go down and try to help solve the problems that the country has right now. Who can best, who do you think is best outfitted to break down those silos? I think I am, because I'd be a member of the majority party, first of all, so I'm going to be able to get more done. Secondly, just because of who I am, um, you know, uh, I'm a different type of Republican. You know, a lot How of people, are you a different type of Republican? Oh, I'm gay, I'm married, I'm pro-choice, I have a 26-year record of um, okay. fighting for those issues. I think a lot of people, and most people in this area, are fiscally conservative and um, live and let live on social issues, mm -hmm. and I think I embody both. Um, both of those philosophies pretty much better than now anyone. you didn't go to the state Republican convention, correct? Right. Because you felt that it was too. Um, I felt as though it, 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 because of its stance on gay rights and abortion well, rights, right? The Republican Party's platform was neutral, and it was put in. You know, there was language put in that I felt as though. Um, you know, I think the Republican Party should be a party that stands for freedom okay. and a party that. Um, very clearly says that you know um, every person in this country should be treated equally and okay. fairly under the law. That's what we've always been about as a party. Mm -hmm. We've always been a leader on civil rights, and we've taken a U-turn. Right. And I think going to the convention for me personally would have been 
um, making a statement that I agreed with they did with the platform, and I obviously uh, didn't. So that stance that you took, and excuse me, and not going to the convention, mm -hmm. wouldn't that put you at odds with the congressional leadership in, not, in Washington, D.C.? Of course, and I'm not... All right, so how are you going to get anything done? Well, you know what, I think um, that, you know, having been through the whole gay marriage fight yeah. here... I mean, they've tried, you know, I mean, they, look what, what they're trying to do with, um, you know with what, abortion on, rights. Right. Uh, you know what? And you need. I think you need another voice yeah. there from a Republican perspective, saying, you know what? The government shouldn't be involved in personal decisions between a woman and her doctor. Yeah. That's Republican doctrine. You know, um, everybody should be treated equally under the law. We were a party that was formed on freedom. We were the ones who pushed the civil rights movement. We were the ones who pushed the uh, uh, women's suffrage movement. You know, we've always been a leader in that. And I think, you know, I think nationally, uh, speaking out on those issues from a Republican's perspective, I could be a real catalyst. Um, and I'd also say, too, just to back up a little, you know, the members of the current delegation right now, um, I know them all, I've worked with them all, mm -hmm. uh, most of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know Nikki Songus as well as some of the others, but I sat next to Bill Keating for years. I sat next to, I, I worked in the Senate with Steve Lynch. Um, I've known Mike Capuano since he was a staff member at the State House. Ed Markey's known me since I was in high school. You know, and I'm not, obviously not going to agree with them on, you know, a lot of issues. But as far as doing what's best for Massachusetts, you know, and being part of a team, that's trying to promote mm -hmm. the state's interest, I think I can bring more to the table than electing a freshman Democrat. Do you, you know, think that the Speaker has earned another uh, two years as, as um, the Speaker? Well, would you vote for him for well, another two years? Well, first of all, I wouldn't vote for Nancy Pelosi. Um, I asked you about like, the Speaker, not Nancy no, Pelosi. But that's the choice. These are what the choices are. And I would say that the Speaker is between a rock and a hard place. There are a group of, people, of Republican congressmen who are obstructionists, um, who don't want to see anything get done. And I view the Speaker as somebody who is more willing to make a deal and bring parties together, except that they're always pulling the rug out from under them. So I don't agree with the Speaker on every issue, but um, if the choices are Nancy Pelosi and the Speaker, I would probably vote for the Speaker um, because, you know, he's, uh, Nancy Pelosi is, you know, not going to be the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to vote for the person who I think is most moderate and who can govern the House who can bring the factions of the House together the best. But given the paralysis that grips Washington in right. Congress, do you think that John Boehner has earned another two years as Speaker? I think that um, ideally, in the perfect world, you'd have new leadership in Washington on both sides of the aisle. Um, I think he's tried to move issues forward, but again, um, even within the Republican Party, there's a split right now, and I want to be on the part of the party that is, you know, able to get things done, that's willing to, you know, to make, to compromise, to, um, you know, and to move the country forward in a lot of, uh, in a lot of areas. Um, I want to, you know, there's a lot of Republicans in Washington who are interested in governing. Mm -hmm. um, Tierney said that. Um, but John Tierney was probably one of the most partisan members of the Congress. I mean, he had no interest in working across the aisle. He. Uh, uh, he told us he did. Well, he told, I'm sure he did, <laughs> but you know, actions speak louder than words. But let's go back to a recent vote that was taken in Congress where seven out of the nine uh, oh, Democrats yeah. in the Massachusetts delegation uh, rejected the president's request mm -hmm. okay, for them to support a proposal where they would arm Syrian rebels and train them mm -hmm. okay, uh, in the battle against uh, ISIS, the growing threat. Um, and. Uh, and uh, um, I mean, how would have you, first of all, what did you think about that, that, that proposal? How would have you voted? Would you have voted with, uh, with Obama to give him the... Um I, would have voted for the, I would have voted with the president. I would have voted to help the president because I think national security issues, particularly with what's going on right now with ISIS, um, need to be nonpartisan. And the president is the commander in chief. And if he's asking for tools to protect the country, um, I would vote to, to give him those tools. And I think the president's problem is is that, you know, he's been all over the map. Um, I think he understands now, obviously, the threat that we were under, but you can't be calling ISIS a JV team, you know, at one point, and then saying they're, you know, the most dire threat. And I think, you know, he has to do a better job um, explaining to people in the country why this is important to the United States. Forget the Middle East. I mean, if you leave ISIS, you know, uh, and allow them to continue 
to grow and I mean you know they're beheading people there's genocide going on right now um, if you allow that to happen what does that mean for the United States and I think I'm, I'm afraid and I think most people are who are watching this and they understand that um, you know at the very least um, we should be training um, you know opposition uh, rebels um, and, and providing them with resources we probably should have done it three years ago um, I think the Congress was a bit cowardly um, in that when they did vote for that resolution, they didn't include airstrikes as part of it. They all sort of voted to arm the Syrian rebels and then headed for the hills. <laughs> you know, uh, and that should have been part of the authorization vote. And um, I think that um, you know it was a mistake not doing it. And I would have voted, and if the, I would have voted with the president on that as well. If, if in the future it is determined that the best course of action might be to commit uh, U.S. ground troops to this effort. Should the president come before Congress and ask for their, 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 their support, yeah. or should he do it? No, no, there needs to be, you know what, there needs to be a national debate um, that takes place, and it needs to be in the Congress, and people um, need to be, you know, Congress shouldn't abdicate its responsibility. That you know, happened under, you know, it's happened for under a lot of presidents before we get to the point that we're at right now. Um, and I think it would be healthy for the country. I mean, people need to be educated um, as to what's going on. They need to see a plan. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the president uh, should come before Congress. It's absolutely necessary to do. One of the uh, the key issues in the uh, the Democratic primary was, was the immigration debate. We had a, a candidate who served as an immigration attorney. She put out her plan. Uh, you know, Tanny uh, 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 basically, uh, uh, you know, I don't think he had a plan. He was just going with what the the, the, the Dream Act or whatever the latest mm -hmm. uh, flavor of that was and stuff. Uh, but um, it, it, it just seems that in light of what's transpiring uh, uh, across the globe, uh, with Ebola, refugees, immigrants coming into America, the border is still unattended and, and um, well, it's not, it's, it's not being attended the way mm -hmm. it properly should be. What are your uh, thoughts, your views on the, the border crisis, yeah. uh, the situation? I know there are both Democrats and Republicans have put forward plans. Some of them, you read the parts of them, put together, they might be a viable plan, but it doesn't seem like yeah, anything. I think comprehensive immigration reform, which was in the Senate, is sort of like Obamacare. It's so huge. You know, nobody knows what's in it, and that is, that's not the solution. I think the first thing that should happen right now is border security. And I think it isn't even an immigration issue anymore. Most people, I think, rightly understand that at this point it's become a national security issue. Um, you know, we have no idea who's coming across the border. Um, Forty percent of all the people who are here in this country illegally came here legally and overstayed their visas. We have no idea who is in this country right now. So those that two components have to be done first. And then I think you have to figure out what to do about the people who are here. You know, obviously we're not going to have a big roundup and, you know, send everybody back. So you're going to have to, you know, um, put together some type of green card program um, for the people who are here. And, and one thing I don't support, and again, um, I differ from Seth Moulton on this, I don't support a path to citizenship. I don't think it's fair for the people who have played by the rules, um, who have waited in line, who haven't been able to get into this country, um, for us you know, to reward people who came here illegally with citizenship. And I don't think that that's right. I think Massachusetts has some very unique, you know, obviously our workforce here, the H-1B visas, um, we should be, you know, those are the, uh, the visas that are given out for uh, highly technical uh, workers. We should be, you know, I'd like to see more of those given out. I mean, those, you know, most countries around the world um, get to decide who comes into their country. Um, you know, and we're at a point where right now where um, our system's set up that we have no control over it, really. And for the thing, you know, for the do you think area, that's really the, the, the country or the, the, the president occupier of the White House wants to see it that way? Well, I think that this has been immigration has been a problem for a long time. I mean, just the fact that again, forty percent of the people who were here illegally came here legally. We don't keep track of anyone. So, but I think that this president has, you know, really exasperated um, uh, the the problem. Um, by acting unilaterally, and that's what he's going to do after the election. And you know, the reason why we had that whole problem with all these unaccompanied minors coming across the border is because he acted on his own. 
and everybody was like, hey, are we going to get into America well, right now? what did now? you expect Congress to do? What, to pass legislation, you know? Um, well, in theory. Oh, I mean, at that point. Well, in theory. Yeah, I mean, well, the Congress should you be know, doing You know, I hear all job. these complaints about the president acting unilaterally, but there's a reason he's doing that. No, because, but you know I mean, what? he's getting no cooperation well, from the legislative. Branch. I disagree with you. I would say that he's been totally detached from the legislative process, and the president has probably been the most partisan president we've ever had, at least in my lifetime. You know, he doesn't even have relationships built up with Democrats, let alone Republicans. And you know, in order to get things done, there has to be give and take. You know, on both sides. And I think you know, you could. The solution is, yeah, let's take care of the border security first. Figure out what to do with the people who are here. Uh, secondly, and you know, you can't just say, I mean, it can't be my way or the highway. And you know, I, I think, again, and, and again, I think most Americans right now are very leery about comprehensive anything. You know, we have, I mean, health care in this state was 77 pages long. Everybody knew what it was. There wasn't, you know, Obamacare, 25 pages. Is that the plan pages. that the Republican governor signed Mitt Romney? Yeah, and I supported it. I supported it. <laughs> and then he ran from that. But I that's supported a whole it story. in the legislature. Yeah. No, and you know what? But everybody knew what was in it. It wasn't complicated. This other one, you know, you have to read it to know what's in it, 2,500 pages. You know, there's going to be a Cadillac tax coming mm -hmm. um, for health plans that's going to affect every public employee. It's going to affect almost every union member and most people in Massachusetts. Um, a surtax put on their insurance. Um, people don't even know about that. That's the next thing that's coming down the line. So when I see a big comprehensive, you know, um, immigration bill, I get worried. One of the things in that bill, uh, what it would do is um, double the number of unskilled workers that are allowed to come into the country. I mean, that's obviously going to have an effect on the economy. Um, we are the only country, I mean, we are a very generous country. Um, we let a million immigrants in every year, which is a pretty good record. Um, you know, and I, I think that, um, you know, uh, we're, we're doing, you know, we have a program in place, we're doing our part, um, but we have to be, you know, we just can't let everything overtake us, and I think most Americans feel like that, that that's what's happening right now. We have no control over it. Uh, that's a good and, and, you know, and I would say one other thing, one difference between Seth Moulton and myself is that, you know, he supports giving illegals driver's licenses. You know, I don't think that that's a good idea. Um, you know, I don't think that's the right way to go, um, and, and, and well, it, it, uh, ends, it ends up being a problem. You know, one of the one of the candidates in that race, uh, the immigration attorney, and um, I got to say, I'm, I'm in Marissa, sync with Marissa. her, by the way. Well, look, she yeah. had a pretty good idea, a, a path to legalization. Right. She said, no, not not to say, let's get them legal first. Right. And, 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 uh, it made so much common sense. And I know some other Democrats and Republicans have raised that. Because we're never going to get over the citizenship thing. That'll take another 10 years. But let's get them on a path to legalization. Do they, can we get them sponsors, job sponsors? Do they have jobs? See, who, who are the criminals that have to be deported? Send them back. But others, okay, if they're willing to work with us, we put them on a path to legalization. They can come out of the shadows. Let's see what they can do. And that's what I support. I'm pretty much in sync with versus yeah the question is actually. you know now now I know uh, this was not going to be brought up before the the, the midterms it, it will ha I think it will have to be bring up brought up after and maybe they'll knuckle down to actually do some uh, do some things but it seemed like uh, it was something that we could get behind and we did support mm -hmm. we thought it was a pretty good pretty good idea yeah. and uh, hopefully that uh, the politics we put aside and that that would that would happen um, uh, but uh, I think people are, are sick and tired. I, I would imagine the the the, uh, the uh, was it 535 people in Congress right now. They, most of them have to be sick and tired. Four, of the way 435. 435. In the House. Well, in the House. Well, I'm, I'm going to add 100. Well, no, no, <laughs> yeah, I'm, adding, you're, you're I'm adding the Senate, too. I thought that was a Well, I'm adding the Senate, too. But I, I, but I think the people, I mean, Americans are wary of it. And I you know what? They're tired of it. And I, I would just say, you know, I have a record of being able to work with I was outnumbered my whole career in the minority. I passed a whistleblower protection bill. You know, um, I had an employee who worked at a hospital who saw things going on at the hospital, substandard care being delivered. Um, came to me, asked me what I should do. I said, report it. He reported it, he got fired. I, I put a bill together protecting all healthcare workers, uh, whether in hospitals or nursing homes. If they see something wrong right now, they can't be it passed. I built a coalition, passed the bill. Um, they can't be fired or demoted or held back um, because of, you know, of, um, of reporting something that they should. 
Um, I was part of the Welfare Reform Act. I helped write the final version of the bill. I wrote the anti-fraud provisions that were in the bill. I had a veteran come to me who was homeless, and believe it or not, in Massachusetts, um, there was no veteran's preference for housing, for state-owned um, housing in Massachusetts. I passed a bill to do that. Um, I, uh, I always say there are three zoos at the in Massachusetts, Franklin Park, Stone, and the State House. Uh, but the two that the state were running, um, Franklin Park and Stone, they were running into the ground. I wrote a bill that transferred the zoos from the state control to a public-private partnership. It's Zoo New England right now. Um, you know, I got a lot of stuff accomplished as a member of the minority party uh, in Massachusetts. And the thought of being able to be part of the majority party, I think I can get a lot done as well. I was you know, involved in education reform, welfare reform, uh, health care reform, all of the you know, big bills that came up in the legislature. And um, you know, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, I'll reach across the aisle. I'll, you know, I, I'll be independent minded. And then as soon as they get there, they're not. You know, and the thing I can say, you know, is look at my record. I've demonstrated you know, that I know how to get along. With you know, people. your admirations are, are extremely admirable. Um, your what? your aspirations. I'm sorry, but you know, <laughs> what what, and I'm sure what what you accomplished at the state house. They were all good bills. Right. But it's a different. It was a different landscape at the state house, and it still is. You can't possibly compare. Beacon Hill to Capitol Hill and the state that Capitol Hill yeah, is not. I mean, do you really you think just, that when you go to bed at night and if I get elected that I'm going to get stuff done? Do you, given, well, given first of what's all, happening Ian, here, I'm not going to be able to go to Washington and change the world. No, no one, You're a change agent. But yeah, but no one person can do that. But, uh, but what I can do, I think, is I can go down and the issues that are important uh, to this region and this state, I, can, I think I can get them on the front burner. And a lot of, a lot of issues... You know, I want to work with Steve Lynch to help repeal the um, uh, Cadillac tax. I want to work with Bill Keating to help repeal the uh, medical device tax. You know, I, I, you build coalitions. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the only way things are going to change down there is by electing people who have a different perspective and a different way of doing things. And I think I can offer the voters, you know, not just, I, I'm not just saying it, I can yeah. offer the voters, um, you know, uh, experience having done it. And in enough, enough districts around the country, you really don't need, you know, to change 435 people. If you can get, like, you know, a coalition of both Democrats and Republicans that you have 30, you know, 35, they can really, you know, be in the center and they can push everything forward. And, and you know, if, I'm not afraid to do that. I mean, I, had, I sat with, you know, Governor Romney who asked me to vote a certain way and I looked him in the eye and said no. You know, and I'm not afraid to do that. It's because I, I know what I believe in. I know who I am. You know, and if I can explain um, and feel good about what I'm doing, uh, it doesn't matter to me. Um, if this one's, you know, people respect you more when you when you <laughs> when you do what you think mm -hmm. is right. You know, um, just uh, uh, before I was interrupted by Mr. Scott here. There was a question. I was to say, well, uh, 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 the, 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 the other issue that, that uh, seems to be below the radar, but it's getting uh, uh, more and more uh, reaction from certain groups, uh, um, f the, the, the First Amendment and privacy rights. Mm -hmm. And it seems more and more the government, and just the intrusion from the government on, on individuals, uh, 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 people collecting information. It's come up several times uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, the government snooping in on the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then you get the the uh, the IRS scandals and uh, and uh, NSA uh, 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 and that the, the fact that uh, they can electronically eavesdrop on you at any time. They can take, you can be getting a phone call. I can be getting a phone call from my family back in Italy, and all of a sudden someone says something, and I'm being investigated. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I mean, it, this, does that come up on you know, a radar at all? I mean, it just seems this government intrusion is getting deeper and deeper. And most Americans are just going about their business, going to work, trying to raise their family. They're not thinking about this thing. Mm -hmm. But people, high level players, are we're obviously, these yeah, we're obviously in a position because of technology that um, those type of things are happening more than they've ever happened before. And the government has become, I mean, you know, the government's become so big, so dysfunctional, you know, and, and disconnected from people. The only thing they do, you know, they don't listen to people. The only thing they're doing well is the NSA is listening to people. Um, so I think that what you have to, I mean, there has to be the right balance. Um, 
and I'm not. I'm, I, I kind of the way I look at it is that you know we've gone through this technology revolution um, that's really moved quickly, and on the other side, um, it's almost overtaken people's civil liberties, and you know it's it's time to examine both and, and figure out what the right balance is, you know because on the other hand now we're dealing with homegrown terrorists. I mean we have, we had a beheading in Oklahoma. And obviously, anybody who looked at that guy's Facebook and you know some of the things that were going on should have been like, "Hey, this is a potential problem," um, and that brings up a whole other set of issues, you know, around civil liberties. And it's going to be, you know, I, I don't know if there's an easy answer, but you know, the pendulum has to fall and be mm. balanced in the in the right area, in the, in the right place. Mm. But you know, even looking at the internet now, uh, in, in the, the the media industry. Um, you know, uh, um, we have to uphold certain standards, okay, we check out our facts, but yet we can still be sued for libel, mm -hmm. all right, but yet on the internet, people can willingly go out there, say lies about people, okay, uh, there's, there's people out there who've damaged companies' stock portfolios by putting lies mm -hmm. out there, and yet there's no uh, punishment, no retribution or anything for it. You know, so, I feel so, your pain. Well, no, no, but <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just, at some point, this, <laughs> so, the, the, that happened to you. Well, I mean, but at some point, this country's got to address that. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, and now you're going to have everything in the cloud, and, and, and I mean, it's just, it's just amazing where this information is going out, and the people that, that, uh, that, uh, the, you know, I'm all for, uh, you know, freedom of the press and everything else. But I think that, like you say, it's got to be fair. Right. It's got to. People have to be still held uh, accountable. Uh, or know the consequences of uh, right. uh, of, uh, of that uh, that free speech, mm -hmm. you know, and what they do with it. So, um, and, and I think uh, um, sometimes the government, I, I don't know, they they, they just don't uh, they, they don't want to get involved in certain things that maybe they should be, and yet they're the ones who first that that can just get a, uh, a, a go get a warrant without even going to a court. Okay, an open court, and, and, and there's uh, you know w one judge who's, who's deciding everything for the government. Right. Who's who's overseeing you know the you know who's providing oversight for those type of to programs and people. But I, again, I think we've gone through a period where there hasn't been oversight. I mean, just to go and look at what's happened at the IRS, the government, um, you know, uh, I think has lost track of who they're serving. You know, um, or why they're in existence, and um, and I think we, you know, I think people are, again because technology's moved so quick, people are just realizing the ramifications of it right now. So I, I, I understand those concerns. Okay, okay. Well, Richard, we want to thank you for coming in here. If you want to leave us with any closing thoughts, why we might want to endorse you in the uh, general election? <laughs> well, I will be a hard worker. Again, I have a, a track record. I think I'm in sync. Uh, with people on the issues that are most important to them, um, you know, particularly um, health care here, immigration, um, and I have the experience. You know, I, when I ran in my House seat um, and my Senate seat, they were both open seats. So I view this almost as part of an interview process to let people know what I can do. You know, and I think I could be a very effective congressman for the people of the district, um, and I think I could get a lot done for the state as a whole. And um, my temperament and my uh, experience uh, has shown that I'm able to work with people. I'm not going to go down to Washington and poke people in the eye and, you know, be one of those, you know, people who are divisive and, and contributing to the mess down there. I, I, I view, you know, the fact um, of who I am as being able to, you know, help move the ball forward and, and hopefully try to, in a small way, because I can't do it all myself, but try to change the tone and tenor of, uh, what's going on uh, in Washington. Thank you very much for coming to this time. Thank Appreciate you. It.